Hi, Andrew. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, I'm glad to be here. So as you know, uh, I've had Daniel and Priya on, and I have you on today, and I'll hopefully if all goes according to plan, which it doesn't always, I'll have Tyler on later this week, and uh, I thought it'd be neat to kind of get a picture of Fractal from different perspectives and the whole scene that's happening and the different projects that you have going on. So I'm really happy that we could speak today. And um, yeah, it's as, nice. I'm, I'll have to listen to the episodes. It sounds like you're going to be interviewing all my best friends. So <laughs> that'll be a fun group. That's the goal. So um, yeah, so to start, I'll ask you this question that I ask everyone. I really love to just get a sense of who people are and as people really, like I'm often interested in specific projects or specific topics as in this case, but also just love people as who they are and people have such fascinating stories and different backgrounds. So I'd love to hear about you, sh you share about yourself and your life story. You can answer this in any way that you want, long, short, metaphorical, you can do an interpretive dance if you want, it's all good. <laughs> yes. uh, anything you'd like to share about yourself and your background and your life story, I'd love to hear it. Um. Who am I? What's my life story? Oh, so it starts in Arizona, clearly. I was born there. And I was raised there. I didn't leave the state much in my childhood. I went to Minnesota, which is where my parents came from once or twice. I went to New York with my dad because he worked there once or twice. And I went to Mexico a couple times because we're on the border. Maybe I went to California or something like. But mostly I lived in Arizona my whole life. I loved it there, actually, although I didn't know it at the time. I didn't really know what it was like to love a place. And I dreamed of going to California because I thought Arizona was boring. Um, I was actually quite a dramatic kid. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was very argumentative. I was very talkative. And I, I wanted to be the president. And uh, then I got into high school. Um, I mean, the stories unfold, I suppose, but mostly I got into high school and I was going to a public school in Arizona and I uh, was in the drama program and I dated the stage manager. And this turned out to be, I guess, a prophetic mistake or something, a fateful event in my life because I broke up with the stage manager and then I was kicked out of drama. I was not allowed to be a drama kid anymore. They didn't like me. They didn't want to see me. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, because of that, and I was good at math. I was, I mean, I was generally just good at my classes. Um, I honestly wasn't that good at drama. I just loved it. And uh, I decided to join the engineering team because one of my other friends, the robotics team, one of my other friends was starting a robotics club at the school. And that's why I became an engineer is kind of just, I needed something to do. I was bored and I joined the robotics team and then dated someone on the robotics team, did robotics, fell in love with engineering, got an engineering mentor who I wanted to be like. And at the time I had kind of a humble goal that was like, well, you know, I want to, I don't want to take money from my dad. I don't want to take money from my parents. And I want to make six figures by the time I'm like 30 as an electrical engineer. And that seems super possible. So I studied electrical engineering and computer science at ASU. Um, and it turned out that I would meet that goal much faster because I took an internship and one thing led to another, and then I took another internship. They flew me out to San Francisco, and I ended up, although dropping out is a series of events where you just kind of postpone going back to college many times. And uh, I postponed going back to college many times because I was in San Francisco doing software engineering at a company called Cul-de-Sac, building car-free cities, which was just among the most fun, interesting things I could possibly do. The team there was amazing. I had really good mentors. I invited some of the people I worked with at my previous hardware startup to uh, come join me there. And it was just kind of a dream come true. And then I, because software engineering in San Francisco, met that six-figure goal. And then I was kind of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do anymore. I, like, I've met all of my goals for life, kind of in happenstance, due to this weird, fateful quitting drama and joining the robotics team moment. And uh, that's about the time that I met Priya and... Uh, my coworker Phil at Cul de Sac convinced me to do co living. So I started a co living house with her. And I guess the rest is more public record. It's like we, we moved to New York, we started Fractal. Um, Fractal has grown a lot. Now there's Fractal University. We have a community college. Uh, I run a boot camp. 
Um, I, I could go into more in that, but I suspect there'll be a lot more questions in that regard. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's, that's my life story. Hmm. What were you like as a kid? I was rather shy to strangers. Um, like a somewhat felt like I didn't want to be perceived, I think, by strangers in that in that sense a bit guarded but for the most part extremely talkative my mom uh, recalls me singing all the time in public so I would uh I would be in the shopping cart and we'd be shopping and I'd just be singing 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 as we went along and and shopped and another kind of famous Andrew story is we were in the car on a long road trip and we were just going through the desert. There was like nothing much to see. I was just asking questions like about the world. And I was just asking whatever question and then big why questions like, oh, yeah, but like, why is it like that? Why is it like that? Why is it like that? My parents at some point got kind of sick of it. And they were like, Andrew, what if we have quiet time? <laughs> and I was like, OK, OK, we can have quiet time. And then I would just ask myself questions and answer them under my breath for the next hour. Uh, so there is a sense in which I, I was always quite outgoing or extroverted, um, despite that kind of initial aversion to making a connection with people. But I, I wanted to be heard and I wanted to ask questions a lot. I wanted to sing. I wanted to express myself. Um, I was argumentative, definitely. I wanted to win <laughs> whenever we got into a disagreement really badly. I wanted people to say that I was right. Uh, but I don't know. I got over that at some point. What was your relationship with your curiosity like in high school when you were, you know, in the drama program and then later switched to robotics? Like, yeah. I was always quite a curious kid. So um, I would say it was a good relationship to curiosity, but like felt very open. And uh, I never really had trouble expressing it publicly. I remember at one point feeling quite shameful because in my Spanish class, I... Uh, the, the, this thing happens in high school, especially in, well, I don't know, I say especially in my high school, I guess. Uh, I shouldn't say public high school generally, I don't know. But especially in my high school where teachers will ask questions and nobody will answer. Even though you know like 10 people in the class know the answer, because nobody's answering the question. Isn't that crazy? I thought that was the craziest thing in the world. So in my Spanish class especially, this was common, where like the teacher would ask questions and there'd just be crickets. I think because people were embarrassed to get the answer wrong, I don't know. But I would just answer the questions. And I remember at one point, one of my seniors, because Spanish is a multi-year class, um, told me, like, you're such a teacher's pet. Why are you like this or something? Mm -hmm. And that hurt pretty badly, but ultimately didn't really change me much. So I think my relationship ended up staying somewhat the same, which is like, I don't know. I wanted to know the answer. I wanted to answer the answer. Um, and I always was pretty happy about that. I think in part thanks to my parents who encouraged it quite a lot. Hmm. And while you were still in school, what was studying electrical engineering and computer science like for you? I loved it. I thought when I was going to college, um, and this was true in high school too, but I had really good friends who believed in me and wanted me to succeed. My best friends in high school were all Mormon and um, they were really smart kids and they were really good kids. And, and so I'm glad I had them. They like protected me in a lot of ways. Um, going to college, I didn't have them because they went on their missions, but I would write them letters and we'd send podcasts back and forth. Hmm. But I remember we always had this kind of attitude together in high school that I carried with me in college, which is like, we should compete to do the hardest classes that we can possibly take and then be the best versus each other in them um, although it was always a collaboration we would do our homework together and stuff like that but um, I brought that attitude to college a little bit and I thought you know what are the hardest majors that I can take that I would do well at and uh, I thought electrical engineering is probably the hardest major that really interests me so I'll do that and I suspect it'll be fun it'll be a fun challenge and that's mostly the attitude that I approached it with um, there are definitely moments where you're kind of like why did I sign myself up for 24 credit hours of classes? Like, I'm, my brain's going to explode. I would do this thing that I 
I still recommend it's 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 pretty fun. But I would load up on session A classes because like in a lot of colleges you have session A versus session B. Most classes take the whole term, but they you can occasionally take a class that's shoved into just half the term. What does session A many... versus session B mean? So basically the term the term was 13 weeks and a session A class is like a six week or seven uh -huh. week class. In, it's like basically the first six weeks, then there's a break, then the next six weeks. So it's just the first six weeks. I and see. a session B class is just the last six weeks. So I would take like a lot of classes you had to take for the whole term, but anytime it was offered, I'd take a class as session A. So then my fir the first half of my semester would feel like 28 credit hour equivalent workload. But then the second half of my semester would feel like a 12 credit hour workload. Hmm. And so for somebody like me who has a ton of fun at the start of journeys, but maybe like starts to get bored after a few weeks, it was like a much better way to get through college because it felt like I could take it easy after I got bored with the semester. And then there was this long break and I would come back with more stamina the next time. Um, so I, I, I guess I mostly just had fun with electrical engineering and computer science. They're interesting subjects. Hmm. Where do you think that attitude that you and your friend group had about like sort of collaboratively competing with each other to be the best you could came from? Well, we had to have fun somehow. And they were Mormon, so <laughs> <laughs> it's plausible. Um, so I, I don't know. Maybe that's not where it comes from. Maybe that's just who we are. But like, there's some sense in which, like, there's there's only so many ways you could have fun. Like, we would play D and D together. That'd be fun. We would do board games. We would play some video games. But like, even their parents were not that approving of playing too many video games. Um, couldn't drink soda really, or like any, anything. Like, coffee is not allowed. You know. So even the most basic kind of degenerate i suppose ways of having fun in high school were just not really uh culturally permissible for the group i was hanging out with so within the culturally permissible ways to have fun it was kind of like one-upping each other with like memory games and quotes and references and inside jokes and then one-upping each other in uh in class basically mm. and it's, i don't know maybe, maybe that's where it came from partially we're all kind of like had high working memory and like to show off in that sense. It was a very boys sort of vibe. Hmm. Do you have any specific memories of uh, instances of that kind of pattern with your friend group? Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of them, mm -hmm. obviously. We're still friends to this day, but um, there's a few, there's a few different ways I could approach the question, but like one of them is uh, we would have these charade games that we'd play with each other where you would have to remember you'd have to like charade an inside joke but the inside joke was not really an inside joke that anyone's told before it's just like a specific funny line that somebody said once in the history of us hanging out and then everyone else would have to guess you just compete to guess like what reference they're <laughs> referring to so there's a lot of like memory games i think that we would come up with and play spontaneously there's a we get into these arguments where we like pass notes back and forth on papers during class and be like arguing about really arbitrary things like uh what uh, what the better class was in Dungeons and Dragons or like who would be who if the, these Star Wars characters ended up fighting even though they never fought in the lore or whatever and um and sometimes it would really blow up it's like you get increasingly heated on paper and then suddenly there was an outburst and at one point I don't know. Like there, there are multiple times where we've been like in screaming matches at each other in class, totally distract, distracting from the class. I have no idea how that. Something weird about high school where things just happen, and I guess you're like, that that was normal at the time. But then the teacher's kind of like, "Can I help you? Like, are you okay?" And we're just like, "Yeah, we're fine. Mm. Um, that's good." Uh, I remember, it was pretty common to get homework, like math homeworks, and to race to see who could finish them first and then another kind of common one was like there was a there was like a, a delinquency competition kind of thing where it's like all of us would all only get straight A's like we wouldn't really accept getting worse grades as part of the sport I guess but then within that framework it's like how lazy could you possibly mm. be so then there was some amount of like who cannot do their homework and then just do it in class right before the teacher collects it and the turn it in last minute and I don't know there's something I credit 
a lot of my pragmatism to playing all these games because in some sense it was just teaching me like life's not that serious and even doing really well is not that serious as long as you practice i guess it's not necessarily easy to manage all the stress of i don't know not doing your homework until the very last minute but if you do it's kind of funny mm. <laughs> i don't know I mean, mm. those are some of the ones that come to mind i guess i like hearing about that uh -huh. I'm realizing more and more that one of the common themes for me that makes people interesting is when I can zoom in on what's really different from my own experience. And so it's just like, yeah. oh, I didn't have a group of Mormon friends where we were like out competing each other. And, you know, it's, it seems like that attitude really, uh, yeah, it was formative for you. So I liked hearing about that. Um, Definitely. Yeah. And there's like some base of unconditional love that they're really good at. That I guess we all became really good at where it's like, I don't know, it doesn't matter how many arguments we get into. It doesn't matter how competitive we get with each other. Like we're going to be there for each other the next week. We would hang out every Friday. So uh, I, I think it's somewhat obvious that later in my life, my work ended up being shaped very much in the form of like, man, I think, I think it's really important that people have relationships where they know that they're going to keep seeing these people no matter what happens. Uh, anyway. Hmm. So you're doing software engineering in school, and then you were working for the startup cul-de-sac, and then fast forward to the present, you know, you're starting this software boot camp. And I wonder, was there anything in between those two things that happened with respect to software engineering? Yeah. Um, the main thing is that I, I mean, I did a bunch of software engineering, both at the company, um, which I was there for three years, and then kind of was growing the team there and training interns. And then also just in my free time, helping my friends break into the industry. And then my wife and I started, my then partner and I, I suppose, started a software company together. So we were selling, well, we were failing to sell, except to a couple early beta users, a uh, software as a service platform that I thought was well-designed and I thought was really cool. And we get a lot of people to tell us it was really cool and really well designed, but that is not how you sell things. I, I, big, we could talk a lot about marketing and sales, mm -hmm. certainly, but uh, I, I built a team and trained a bunch of people. It was especially one of the reasons that we're starting a boot camp is because my co founder, Jake, and I both have this like habit in our careers as software engineers, especially as managers or team leaders, of hiring people who basically don't know how to code or who are just out of boot camp and training them to be exceptional contributing members to our teams, um, and then helping them land better jobs after they leave that team. So we've clearly always liked this kind of accelerator approach to talent rather than the like searching for the top talent that you have to pay a lot for approach. Um, so that's kind of why the story fits together, I suppose. Does that describe your own software career? Yeah. Also, um, I think for me, I wouldn't be where I was if Ryan, the CEO of Cul-de-Sac, didn't take a bet on me. And um, I'm not going to forget that. I don't think I'll ever forget that. In general, people aren't where they are if people don't take bets on them. But um, it was kind of bizarre to hire me as the only technical member of the Cul-de-Sac team when I was basically an intern straight out of college. And I, there's some part of me that like couldn't believe it was true, even at the time. Um, but it made sense. It's like his bet paid off because I worked really hard and he um, encouraged me to work really hard. So there was something that he saw or that he was able to bring out of me. And I think good, good leaders basically do this for people. Hmm. How would you describe those qualities that you think he saw? I think what he saw in me was that I was just super interested in doing good work and I didn't have very many blockers to that. Like the big blocker was that I didn't have an opportunity to do good work. I was just in school. And I think when we talked and based on, I think also I got a good referral because I just worked at this hardware company um, with a, an electrical engineering mentor who I think talked to Ryan about me. And so obviously having those warm connections is really important. But I think I think they talked 
and kind of mutually agreed that I was the sort of person that just like puts continues to work until I understand how the system is working and until I can improve the system because I don't have anything better to do with my time. Kind of similar to the competition thing with the with the boys. It's like, I don't know, what else am I going to do? Mm. I'm 20 years old and bored. Like mm. I might as well become a good engineer. But I didn't really realize that about myself, I guess. I kind of thought I was a little bit lazy. Um, but I think Ryan saw otherwise, and he was right in that sense. What do you think made you see yourself that way at that time? Well, from the internal perspective, I never have and I guess never will, based on the evidence, reach my potential. Um, it feels like there's always more I could be doing and... And not not just like a little bit, like it feels like most I waste most of my time uh, mm. and it has always felt like I waste most of my time. I think maybe that's just what it feels like to be a person. It's like most of our time is spent doing kind of arbitrary things that don't really move the needle on our, our biggest, most important values. So I'm always trying to, I don't know, find ways to lever myself, but so many of them don't work. And then you're just kind of stuck, I don't know, doing whatever, walking yeah. around in circles for most of your life. And uh, I, I guess that's what it feels like inside. But then, of course, when I look at my own progress and my own projects from the outside perspective, which I'm capable of doing, I'm just like, oh, yeah, this just looks like good progress, consistent effort applied over a long period of time. Um, I guess it just shows that there's always more that you can be doing. Hmm. Hmm. Can you say more about how you see potential? Yeah, well, at least for myself. For other people, it's different. But for me, it's like I, I notice very clearly the difference between what it feels like to be doing um, trajectory-altering work or to be in a trajectory altering conversation, um, or to be enjoying, like genuinely just enjoying my life. And maybe those are like, I don't know, you can say those are like the pillars of a good life or something. Let's say, I don't know. Um, but whenever something is different, I feel the waste or the opportunity cost very um, saliently as a missed potential or a missed opportunity or lost potential. And so I see my potential as like, I could be having those trajectory altering work experiences like at least eight hours a day. And most, because I have that free time. And most days I get, I don't know, two at best, hmm. maybe, M m many days less. And, uh, and the rest of the time just feels like either busy work or, or not working at all. Just like thinking about working and not working, which is just so can be very like filled with suffering sometimes. Um, but but in a normal way that you grow accustomed to and whatever. Um, but and similarly, like you you think like, oh well, instead of thinking about work, I could have just been enjoying my life, but I wasn't doing that either. And so uh I think a lot of I don't know, a lot of my feelings of potential have to do with feeling like there are wasted moments or wasted opportunities that are like all over there's ten thousand dollar bills lying on the sidewalk and I'm literally not picking them up. I guess. Hmm. What were some of your most pleasant or enjoyable experiences of doing software engineering? Man, there's a lot of really enjoyable times. I, I burnt out doing software engineering, so I guess there's also unenjoyable times. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the most enjoyable by far was when I was doing hardware. Uh, I was writing firmware for a like wristwatch wearable, kind of like an Apple watch but with no screen, only haptics. And so the device would communicate with you through touch only, um, which is an interesting interface and much more expressive than people recognize. But we we felt like the watch wasn't the right form factor. So we wanted to expand it into a headband. The watch had four actuators, so like four points of contact that could vibrate. And we wanted eight haptic actuators instead. Um, and our our firmware that we'd built 
the communication protocol between the different uh, actuators didn't support that number. So we had to use a different communication protocol. And that was my internship project. It's basically migrate from what's called a pulse width modulation communication protocol on this chipset to a I squared C communication protocol. And the details of that obviously are, are too complicated to get into. But the short answer is it's a lot of like reading, printing out PDFs that are like uh, spec sheets for each of the different devices that are on your chip um, set. And then manually uh, like scanning them and pulling out the commands, the individual like sets of bytes that you need to send to those devices in order to get them to do what you want. And this is not like a library. There's no SDK. It's just like somebody wrote down in a PDF somewhere, like first send 888 to this port and then uh, send 2222 and then, you know, and, and then you will have programmed the chip. And at that point, setup mode has closed and you've entered normal usage. And this is how you do normal usage. And uh, being able to build up that like castle in my head of all these kind of arbitrary and specific pieces of information for this device, which is unique to us that nobody else has ever built. It's like, um, I don't know, it's like building a cathedral or building a bridge or something. Like you, if you get any piece wrong, it all crumbles and also you it's not like multiple people can help you you just have to hold the whole thing in your head and um that was an interesting task in kind of creative architecture design of like how do i how do i become the sort of person that can remember all of this and can hold it all in my head and can organize it all in software hmm. comparatively a lot of modern web development feels a lot like you just like get the library and use the library and so there's not as much re there's not as much research basically, and I I think fundamentally I'm a researcher, um, hmm. although I haven't had the chance to do too much of it in my life. How did you keep all that in your head? I wrote it down, uh -huh. so I guess I didn't. Uh -huh. um, I had a I had a big working journal. I would have multiple different types of writing. So like, I would have all the documents themselves, which I would mark up and highlight. So I would use highlighters, pens, and pencils, and then I would have my working journal, which is like anytime I'm confused and working through problems and working through interfaces and designing interfaces, you call it like a design notebook, which is like scratch work. And then I would have my like final section where I write down everything that I'm like, okay, this is crystal clear. This is the interface. I would write it down there and then I would translate that into software. Sounds like you ended up making your own documentation for yourself. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you you end up having to because your system is one of one when you're building hardware. Mm -hmm. Going back to the startup that you and Priya were making, like you were kind of describing it in this way that, um, like, oh, um, you know, you just had a few customers that were sort of interested in what you're doing and you thought, oh, if we make it look really good, like that'll sell it. And I'm curious, like what kinds of lessons did you learn about that from that startup? I learned a lot of lessons. I wrote an essay called um, Giving Up hmm. at I think the end of 2021. Is that right? When we gave up on that startup for 2022. And um, it has all my lessons better than I could speak them in the podcast. So if, if anyone's particularly interested in kind of the psychology of a failed founder, you can read that. But the big ones, the big takeaways for me were like, man, it is really, really lonely to tell the people around you that you know what you're doing and to not know what you're doing. And it's just like super bad vibes. And I don't recommend anyone does it. And I'm never going to do it again. Um, that was the biggest takeaway by far. A lot of startup founders, I think, feel pressured, especially young startup founders, feel pressured to imply that they're making progress. Because there is, you're working so hard. I was working so hard. <laughs> I remember at one point, I was in this hotel with Freya. 
basically a hotel. It was actually an apartment building, but yeah, apartment buildings sometimes feel like hotels. And it had like a pool and a hot tub. And we had a room with our two desks and like our two external monitors. And like we were jacked in coding. And then I would go to the hot tub and I'd read my book about the software industry. Like the all my startup books that kept me fueled or whatever on my Kindle in the hot tub. And I'd go back and I'd code and I'd go to the hot tub and I'd go back and code. And like, I'd just do that all day and then I'd sleep. And it was like that for months. And it just feels like there's so much movement. There's so much progress. There's so much going back and forth between the hot tub and my and my machine. There's so many pull requests. There's so many commits. And how can that not all add up to something people want? And it's like, oh, it's just obvious that it, it doesn't add up to something people want because you didn't sell it to them. Like, it's, it's really that simple. What I should have done in retrospect is I should have been like, guys, I think there's something here and I have no idea how to do it. I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. Priya doesn't know either, but like we know how to build it. We're smart enough to build it and we don't know anything else. We don't know how to find the people who want to buy it. We don't know how to sell it. And like for the next six months, I'm going to work every day on trying to become the sort of person that can sell this thing. If I really wanted that to be the thing that I was doing with my life. And uh, instead, I stayed inside the kind of comforting identity, which is the person that could build it. I was the person that could build it, but I wasn't the person that could sell it. And neither was my co-founder. It's just a classic startup mistake. There's like no build it and they will come. And uh, there's a there's a lot of kind of combined mistakes here that I write about in that piece. But like, I don't think user research works. I did so much user research. I talked to so many customers. So many of them had like pain points that I knew I could solve. It's like customer pain points don't tell you where your market is. And talking to customers don't tell you where your market is. I think the main thing that tells you where your market is, is your like the people buying your product. And there just weren't enough of those people to sustain a business in the long run. Um, I, I think people, I guess the main kind of cure there, if you say like, this is the diagnosis, but what do you do about it? Is like, if people aren't 10 out of 10 on your problem so hard and they feel so strongly about it that they're not like, you tell them about the fact that you're the type of person who can solve it. And then they just say, like, okay, I'll pay you. Of course I'll pay you. Like, that problem is so big that just the fact that you're the type of person who can solve it makes me at least want to give you a little bit of money to have a chance that you can solve my problem. Um, if that's not the nature of the problem, I just don't think it's big enough. It's like not, it's, or you need to be the type of person who's like, I'm never going to give up on this. I'm going to, like, even if I die poor, I'm going to work on this for the next 50 years. It's like, you can change the world that way, too. But that wasn't the sort of thing we were trying to do. Um, and which brings me to kind of the second point, which is like during that time, a big lesson that I learned was like what I started thinking about as I felt like I wasn't making as much progress as I wanted on the business side of things with the company was starting these co-living houses and bringing community together. And I started thinking about the retreats that I wanted to host. And I was putting in grant applications to like host gatherings of all my favorite people across the world that I was meeting on the internet. And I was thinking about Twitter and I was thinking about like, man, there's this network here that's so powerful and I can help them. Like I know what they want. I know what they need because I'm one of them. They are, they are, we're the same tribe and I know what I need. And, and then everything that I did that was directly in response to those feelings, which just motivated me in my free time, motivated me in the shower, even without being paid. Um, even though like I haven't made a cent from most of the co-living stuff. Uh, it's like that stuff, it all blew up every time I did anything in that space. It was like it got really popular and a bunch of people wanted to talk about it and a bunch of people wanted to come through. And it's like, oh, I just was focused on the wrong problems. Hmm. How would you describe the problems that you were facing and that other people were facing that made working on co-living and fractal so resonant we were so lonely mm -hmm. <laughs> people were so lonely i mean the pandemic happened that's the big thing so it was a catalyst for emotions that had been brewing for a long time 
and I I left my best friends in the world, these Mormon friends, and I left my family, and I love my family. I left my state to go to California, and the only family I had there, fam- like whatever you could say, family friends, whatever. The only family I had there was my team, and then COVID happened, and I didn't have them anymore either, and. Man, that felt so bad. Mm. I had roommates who wouldn't talk to me. Mm. Like, it was crazy. I wouldn't talk to them. I mean, it's not, it's equal. It's mutual. It was so bad. I remember having an experience where I, I went into the kitchen to make myself a meal and I was eating my food and my roommate was making food and we did not say a word to each other. And we just like pretended that the other person wasn't there and then we went into our rooms. And that was like one of the living situations I was in in San Francisco before I started doing co-living. And I talked to some of my friends about this and they're like, yeah, that's just like roommates. Mm. Mm. That's crazy. That's a crazy, insane state of affairs. I mean, it blows my mind. We, we intentionally didn't make eye contact with each other, even though we were both in the same house because mm. we had so much desire to be separate that we wouldn't even allow a moment of connection to like bring us together. And... It's like I was clearly doing this to myself in a way. So anyway, my friend Phil got me into co-living and that was clearly so powerful. We started the co-living house during the pandemic. It really changed our lives. And then I went to a retreat in Europe and that retreat was so transformational. I connected with so many people. It felt like I had finally found a place where people knew how to... I don't even, it's like the ba- the basic thing of talking. Like they knew how to talk, finally. Everyone else did small talk my whole life. And then finally at this retreat, it was like everyone knew how to talk about what mattered to me. Um, and every conversation was stimulating and every eye contact was like explosive. And it was like, whoa, what is, go- like, what are these people doing differently? I, it ju- I needed to know. So I was really interested in that problem of like what is the difference between somebody who has like gravitas or what is the difference between somebody who has charisma and somebody who doesn't so I read a bunch of books I read Impro by Keith Johnston and I read um I don't know I don't even remember now I read some collection of books to try to figure out what charisma was and I realized like there was a sense in which me and everyone around me in the cities that I was living in were shying away from opening up to each other at all because we were so either afraid of connection or afraid of being a burden of or be, of annoying each other. It's kind of like in New York on the subway, you close yourself off because you don't want to open up a connection with anyone on the subway because they might not be available for that right now because they're busy. They're but they're going somewhere. And actually I think that's polite. Um but when you do that with everyone in your career and in your house and in your society and in your city, like it just feels like you are totally alone. <clears throat> so I, I started thinking more about like, how do you, how do you start to be the type of person that opens yourself up to other people without um, scaring them or something without like accidentally being too much. And, uh, and it turns out it's really easy when you kind of ground that in house that already has good relationships with each other so we started doing more of that um i forgot the original question but you answered it that was powerful (laughs) (laughs) it's great um i'd be curious to hear you describe the arc of um how you know you did this co-living house during the pandemic and then moved to New York and started doing Fractal. And then, uh, of course, now there's Fractal U. Can you kind of describe that arc from your perspective? Yeah. So the most important part of that, so I was in San Francisco doing co-living. The co-living house decided to split up at the end of the year of our lease because it was still the pandemic. And San Francisco at the time was really not a great place to be. Um, And most people wanted to go back to be with their families because they were starting to get homesick. Um, And you were quite locked up in SF at the time. So we decided to disband the house. 
And Priya and I decided to take that opportunity to just be remote for a little while because we were starting our company. We didn't have anywhere to be. So we spent some time in Arizona and I, I got over my homesickness, hanging out with my friends there for a while. But then we went to Berlin, we went to Portugal, we kind of were traveling around. Um, we ended up in New York because the person who we founded that co-living house with invited us to live with him. And we never lived in New York before. So we were traveling around, seemed like a great opportunity. And it was around this time that I was starting a research project with my friend, Jason Ben, who people on the podcast might know as the kind of organizer of the neighborhood SF and city campus out there, and also one of the archive organizers. And we were doing a research project on the concept of seniors, which is like, if genius meets scenes, uh, where the idea is kind of like, genetic predeterminism is obviously not true in a lot of instances because you find extremely strong, oftentimes like multiple orders of magnitude stronger or multiple standard deviations stronger effects on success from people who knew other successful people. So rather than people who are like predetermined in that industry to be smarter, whatever that means, um, genetically, it was more like there were these uh, cohort effects where specific cohorts of people would all become successful together, re mostly regardless of their talent. And um, with some exceptions, but the we were really interested in this effect because it was like, whoa, if this is true, like our society is structured wrong. <laughs> like, everyone is structuring society around talent acquisition like how do you go out and find the best talent and bring them in that's like how the entire tech industry um recruiting pipeline is structured but actually if seniors is correct then we should be structuring things based on cohort effects we should be finding the most talented cohorts we should be creating the most talented cohorts and the, the other thing that the seniors research finds is that because these are cohort effects and they're not predetermined you can kind of organize so like there is actually an action we can take to increase the amount of talent in the world if seniors is true. So we were trying to figure this out. Like, are there actions we can take to increase the amount of flourishing or the amount of talent or the amount of um, genius in the world? And what would those actions be? So we were researching all these different groups throughout history and, and doing comparative analysis. And uh, what we found after doing all that research and debating with each other a lot and writing internal memos and sending them back and forth and having a bunch of calls is um, definitely it's possible to do this. Definitely many people have done it intentionally and written about intentionally doing it. And definitely many people have done it unintentionally by accident. And um, these people share qualities. So we decided like, okay, well, we can just be some of the people who do it intentionally. And uh, Jason was in San Francisco and I was in New York with Priya and we were just kind of like, okay, let's compete. Like Priya and I in New York and you at SF, and we'll see who makes the better golden age, basically. So we were, you know, kind of, again, kind of like this competition with my Mormon friends, I guess, where it's like, I don't know, I don't have anything better to do. This just seems like a, a fun and good thing to spend my time on. And, uh, and it was really exciting. It felt almost like rebellious or something, um, subversive. And so I... Yeah, I kind of had this idea in my head of like, it seems pretty possible to create a golden age in one generation. And one of my inspirations on the internet um, and mutual to us, you've had him on the podcast, is Visa. And Visa also is just kind of publicly like, I don't know, we could just build a golden age. It doesn't seem that hard. It's like, you could definitely do it in one generation if people organized. So I took a lot of inspiration from the fact that he was publicly talking about those things to also publicly talk about them. Because if he can do it, so can I. Um, even though it felt a little bit embarrassing or or cringe, I guess. And and we just thought, Priya and I, like, well, what would we do? Like, at the most trivial, what's the most straightforward way of doing this? Because we have no idea how. And we're like, okay, we're going to collect 1,000 friendly, ambitious nerds all in the same walking distance neighborhood. So 1,000 friendly, ambitious nerds in a 10-minute walk. That seems like we don't know how else to do it. We're not smart on this. We're not, we've never done it before. So surely that will produce, like, some incredible effects. And that was really the only thing that led to Fractal was that initial premise. And then everything else was kind of like, okay, but how do you do that? And how do you make it fun? And how do you resolve tension in the community? And how do you 
make sure everyone is in charge of their own lives? How do you make sure everyone's sovereign? Because Priya and I are very liberal, so we don't want to be in charge of other people or to tell them what to do, and we don't really want to have to govern. So how do you do it without a governance structure? And each of those challenges kind of presented its own need to design solutions, which all went into Fractal. Um, kind of some of the core principles are that each apartment should be self-governed. So there is no larger governance organization which governs units of living. The unit of living, like the household, is the natural governance unit of society. Um, the atomic unit is the individual, but like there is no larger governing organization for households because households have such different cultures inherently, and that could lead to some clash. But there are many larger conglomerates which combine households. It's just that none of them have authority over the others. They're all kind of peers in that sense. And um, so, so very federated where like the sovereign unit is the household. And, uh, and then Fractal University kind of came from that, like as that grew and we got to 10, 13 households all in the same um, walking distance neighborhood, some people started teaching classes to each other just spontaneously because we're nerdy people. And one person put on a screening of Andre Carpathy's Zero to Hero lecture. And uh, many of you probably haven't watched this lecture, but it's really good. Andre Carpathy is a great teacher and he's teaching about a really complicated subject. He's teaching about how to build a transformer model, like how to build a large language model, basically. And he invented ChatGPT, so he's qualified, but also he's just, he explains it really well, he's patient, he um, covers every step. It feels like one of the best lectures I've ever seen um, for such a technical subject, and much better than most of my college classes. So I thought, like, why don't we just do this more often? I bet there's a ton of really good lectures on the internet. EDX and MIT OpenCourseWare, there's just so many amazing professors. What if we just take the best OpenCourseWare and start screening it for each other as like kind of a semester system to organize it so that people feel more motivated to complete their classes? And that was the original idea for Fractal University. And people were in, and in our first semester, we did five classes. It just turned out that all the teachers that wanted to like teach a subject were just too ambitious. <laughs> they all like joined and they were like, yeah, I'm kind of basing it on this class, but I'm just going to do all my own lectures because I feel like I could I could do better than them in these certain ways, especially given the context of the students. And so it turned out that people were much more interested in learning how to be teachers, learning how to be um, great instructors than they were in just screening lectures from other instructors. And then that kind of made Fractal University obvious. It was like, oh, Fractal University isn't just about people coming together to learn. Fractal University is about people coming together to teach um, as well. And in that sense, it's, a, it's kind of a factory that produces community leaders in particular niches. Um, so then it just kind of grew naturally. Um, and I guess that's the, that's the main origin story for, for both of those projects. Hmm. How did you and Jason get interested in seniors? Good question. <laughs> I, I don't fully remember. I know the person who made the course that Jason and I read through with our research project, with our research group, was um, Arnaud Shank, who now runs the Polaris Fellowship. Um, and he put together this course called Organizing Genius, which is very much about this question of like, is it possible to organize genius? And he's interested in the same sorts of topics. And I remember reading this, maybe on the Progress Studies Forum or something, um, somewhere on the internet, and thinking like, oh, we should do this. And I think Jason and I must have just, maybe I reached out to him or maybe he, uh, Twitter. My guess is Twitter. Um, but if it wasn't Twitter, then it was some, some mutual connection. And I think it just, we hit it off right away when we met each other and we clearly wanted to talk about this. So my suspicion is that it happened really quickly, which is why I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
And if loneliness was sort of the problem or need that people had that co-living and fractal solved, what would you say the need that fractal U is solving? Rigor. It's like, I mean, there's a number of, of co-related concepts, but people have a sense the same way that I have had a sense my whole life of potential. It's like a, it's just a genuine felt sense that we have it all the time. I think it's where justice comes from. The idea of an injustice is like a wasted opportunity, but in the, in the reverse and negative sense of like, oh, wow, look how much damage was done that was unnecessary. Like this must be corrected somehow. This needs to not happen again. And I kind of think this ability to compare differential uh, counterfactual worlds is at the core to morality. It's at the core to people's conception of virtue. Um, what does it mean to be good? It's like, well, really, what, mean, what it means to be good is just to be better than you could otherwise imagine. Better than the counterfactual. That's what it means to be good. And like to be the best just means to continually be better than the counterfactual until you can't imagine being better than the counterfactual anymore. And I, I don't really think there's any other way of finding what's good except this kind of iterative counterfactual comparison process. Um, so, and I think everyone kind of has, or at least that's, the, that's one of the most natural ways to find the good, I should say. I don't, I'm not trying to get into an ethical debate about how we find good. But um, I think, so a lot of people have this natural conception of potential and of virtue and of what they want to be doing with their time. And I think Fractal University came out because for a lot of people, their conception of uh, what would feel good for them is to spend more time reading, to spend more time writing, to spend more time doing research, um, especially the people in our community and many of the people in your community, I think. Uh, it's just like we, we all remember the times where we read 20 books a year or 30 books a year or 40 books a year, 50 books a year for some people. And now we kind of regret that we have slipped in our habits and now we only read three or 10 or whatever um, for each person is different. Or we remember the times when we had so much fun studying electrical engineering in college and we regret that we have given up on that habit. And Fractal University kind of says like for the low cost of like free because it's sliding scale uh, payments for the volunteer teachers, you can just become this sort of person that you remember being and that you might want to become again and you can pick up new skills and uh, you can improve yourself. So I think this, I don't know, it's just a community of self-improvement. Um, so I think it, it meets people's need to be becoming something, uh, to be making something of themselves. Let me think how to put this. Um, you said earlier that people had intentionally and unintentionally created seniors and it's like it's been done before and you you know you and Jason had this sort of goal competition to do it in your respective cities and how would you describe the what you learned about how seniors was created what's sad i think is like i'm still trying my best to articulate it and I, I wish it's like I've learned so much, but I don't know how to say all of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I can tell you some of like the big takeaways. And I hope they I don't know. I hope my intention is imparted, I suppose. One of the most obvious ones is that every seniors that I've ever studied and the ones that I have like the kind of sub scenes in Fractal that I've seen succeed versus the sub scenes in Fractal that I've seen falter. Um, I think every one of these kind of successful scenes has an unblocking culture, which means people give each other favors. Like there's favor abundance, favors are being thrown around everywhere. Like people want you to succeed. They want you to succeed because they know it's good for them. They know it's good for you. They know it's good for the world. And like, it costs them nothing. People encourage each other because they know it's good for you. They know it's good for them. They know it's good for the world and it costs them nothing. They, they criticize or it, criticize is like, this is another thing. Um, in these cultures, in a senius, criticism doesn't feel bad because people know that badly structured criticism is bad. <laughs> and it's obvious that it's bad. It's bad because it discourages somebody. And if it wouldn't discourage them, then people will just give that feedback, but then it wouldn't be called bad criticism anymore because they would take it well. 
And there, there's a sense in which people are trying to push each other forward or raise each other's aspirations or um, like we are all, we are all, it's like that implies that there's a collective consciousness, which I think is sometimes a trap. Um, each person individually is conscious of and socially motivated to contribute to the flourishing of their neighbors, of like everyone around them. Um, and I don't know, I guess like the more important question is like, how do you make that happen? I think my best response so far is like modeling good behavior, leadership, talking about bad behavior openly um, without shame and like want, like you just want, you need to want it. I think people already want it. Like luckily you're working with the fact that people are mostly good. Um, but that's one of the big ones. Another one is like, you can just do things radically. You can like, like this is just radically true. You can just do anything that your body allows you to do. Like anything in the laws of physics, you can just do. Um, not all of those things are legal. And so like, you know, whatever. And not all those things are socially permissible. permissible. But I think in senior cultures, you the Overton window is much wider for the things that people are allowed to try or allowed to experiment with as long as they don't betray other people's trust, basically. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, this person's trying to do this weird thing. Like, they're trying to start a company that seems silly, but they, like, have so much conviction that we're all just going to help them do it because they're going to learn a lot of lessons anyway, and it's going to be super worthwhile. Um, or, you know, with Fractal University, I think there's a similar thing where it's kind of wild that people are letting unqualified teachers teach them in some ways, you know, one might think, oh, but are they allowed to teach? And it's like, you can just teach people. Like, you can just do it. The only thing that is required is that your student, like, is is happy with that. Um, I think in a lot of these cultures, there's, there's a big amount of kind of belief that you can just play these new games that nobody has played before and that that's okay. Um, and you won't feel shamed for that. Alan Kay talks about and I think about a lot, the combination of two attributes that make a great researcher. One is that they they must do whether they are paid or not. And that's what makes somebody an artist. And then the second quality is that their doings are likely to be highly interesting or important. And that's what makes somebody a good recruit for your team. So like when you're an organizer, you want to organize people based on those two qualities. First, you want artists who will do the thing that they need to do because they have to do it. And then second, you want to you want to like curate. So you want to make sure that you have confidence that those people are going to be doing interesting things because otherwise you can't be a very good leader to them, can you? Um, so there's something there too where I think people are self-selecting into, in, in all these groups, they're self-selecting into groups where they believe those things about each other. And I think a common failure mode for non seniors or failed seniors or whatever is that, or just groups that don't go on to do anything, is like their doings are not, like they don't have to do the thing that they're doing, whether they're paid or not. They're doing things that they can take or leave, which is just not, like that's just not how the world is. Like history is a museum of passion projects. Um, the world is a museum of passion projects. It's like, I, I believe that most of the world is shaped by extreme passion, by art, basically. And if you don't feel like you're at that edge where you're able to do the thing that you're most passionate about, you need a group of people who can help you find that for yourself. So I think a lot of seniors either collects people who are able to focus on their passion and helps encourage them, um, by noticing how it can be interesting or important and connecting them with that, or uh, helps people kind of move on from the things they're doing that are clearly they're not passionate about or they clearly detest. And those are a few things, but there's a lot of like tactical things too, like hosting every week. Really important. You have to host every week. You have to have lunch table conversations. You have to have like serendipitous interactions. A third space is really helpful. Um, people should not be getting into extremely dramatic interpersonal relationships with each other if they want to also be like making a lot of progress on their goals 
because you know and th these things kind of stack up and you can kind of add them all up or whatever but you know speaking of tactics i know you all did that dinner party early on and what yeah. were some of the other things that you all tried to build community and build seniors the most important like tactical so I, yeah i talked a little bit previously it seems like those are more strategic um, you should always be focused on those but like tactically the most important thing was weekly dinners we hosted weekly dinners on sunday every sunday and we never kicked people out of our house once they showed up um, it was their home for that night we did that for over a year and even when we didn't want to even when we were depressed, even when we were having bad weeks, it's like we just did it because we loved, we wanted our home to be their home and it's not their home if they can't come. Mm. If they can't open the door and get in, it is not their home. So there's, that's a really hard part about being a host, I think, is like, it can be really difficult to capture the sensation in people of feeling like they have a home away from home because it requires you to always be available to them the same way that like your parents were always available to you in making your home. There's never a time where you're locked out as a kid. Uh, even if your parents are annoyed, even if they're depressed, even if they're having a hard week, like you can't be locked out um, because it's your home and you share it with them. And I think the best hosts understand how to make that homey space. Um, so that that's, Probably the most important thing, and then some other really important things that we definitely did were like, uh, we would sublet to people when they were moving into the city rather than forcing them to sign their own leases so that they could live near us. A lot of people wanted to come to New York for just one month. Some people wanted to come to New York for just two weeks, three weeks. Some people wanted to come to New York in like stupid dates where they're like April 14th to May 14th. And I'm like, how do you think I'm supposed to organize the logistics of this so that I can pay my rent if I'm going to rent to you for these like random dates? And then we just do it anyway, because that's the de dedication we had to making a home for people where they were welcome to come stay and um, hang out. And it's also because we want it. I mean, selfishly, I wanted the golden age. I wanted it so badly. I wanted it so badly that I was willing to sacrifice my time to find these stupid like date clashes with people so that our rooms were rented and we could pay rent. Um, I wanted it so badly that I was willing to put my name on five leases. And that was the that was probably the craziest financial thing we did, which is we, yeah, we were on five leases. And I don't necessarily recommend this for a variety of reasons, but it's what we did so that any time that anyone needed a place to stay in New York, we had a home for them. And uh, anyone meaning like, you know, the people that we thought, needed this that we were building this for and those people were distributed around the world so we could never predict when they were going to come visit and we got really really good at creating systems um really really good i mean we never even made a spreadsheet out of it so how good did we actually get is i guess an open question but we got really good at least informally at making systems to make sure these rooms were filled so that we never had to fear that we were on the hook for all this money that we probably couldn't afford to pay. Um, so there's definitely a little bit of like, call it kind of Pollyanna-ish belief that we needed this to succeed, even if it cost us financially or even if it cost us um, socially or emotionally, because I think it's a little bit like having kids or something. It's like, I just, I wanted it enough that I was willing to suffer. Hmm. What are some of the big lessons that you've learned over the last few years, both from running the co-living situation and then starting Fractal U? There's a lot of lessons about like emotional and spiritual management that are hard to communicate, but are probably the most important. Um, doing the wrong thing is so much more costly than anything else like it's so much better to like do the good thing slowly or to do the good thing shame ashamedly or to do the good thing cringely than to do a bad thing 
is just so much better. And I don't mean bad as in like, um, a, a bad job or like you failed. I mean bad as in like it makes you feel bad. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, just like don't feel bad. It's really, really harmful to feel bad all the time. Um, obviously doing things that again I said I, I'm willing to I want this so much that I'm willing to suffer it's like okay this is different actually it's like I want this good thing so much that I'm willing to stress myself I'm willing to push myself and it's like going to the gym or whatever um, I don't mean that you shouldn't ever be stressed in fact I embrace stress in a lot of cases but it's just there are these there are pits and the pits are just so important to avoid um so I guess that's the negative way of looking at it, which isn't as directional as the positive way of looking at it, which is like, just do what you want. <laughs> you have to be doing what you want. And it's every time that I've done something that I didn't want, it was a total distraction from doing the things that I wanted to do. And that does sometimes mean that you need to have longer time horizons. Because if you have really short time horizons and you only do what you want, you're going to come across as like really selfish. And... um and like all over the place it's like oh i want this right now and now i want this and now i want this and nobody can predict your actions um and that can be socially distracting um but i think if you have kind of a 10-year plan that's like what i really want more than anything is i want to create a golden age in new york city with my friends while i'm having fun while i'm building my family with my wife like, kind of like all the it's like clear vision and any time that I kind of picked up work that didn't work toward that vision, it was a mistake every time. I, like sometimes I do it for money. Sometimes I do it to help a friend. Um, but it was just always a mistake when I wasn't, because I knew what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's probably the biggest one. And it's just hard to communicate. People need to learn the lesson for themselves that like there is a, there is a direction in your life that you want to be walking and walking in that direction is going to feel best and it's going to give you the best results. Um, more directional for a lot of people, I guess, or more easy to communicate is like, there's a lot of things that aren't doing the thing. So let's say you want to build a golden age in New York City, or, and, and then tactically you've decided that what you want to do is gather a thousand people. There's a lot of things that aren't gathering people. Talking about gathering people is not gathering people. Thinking about gathering people especially is not gathering people. Um, like building tools to gather people is not gathering people. Planning to gather people is not gathering people. Writing down lists of people to gather is not gathering people. Like there's all these things that you can do that feel like work that are total distractions from the actual task, which is like you set for yourself, you wanted to gather people. Um, that's not to say that there aren't instrumental kind of useful tools or systems. There are, but it can really be a mistake to end up uh, spending too much time thinking about or dreaming about or talking about or wanting or, you know, whatever, the thing that you want, that you actually want. And those can all, like, be validated socially by the people around you because people won't tell you when you're failing, um, which is tragic, <laughs> I think, but, but often true. And um, what else is, like, the biggest the biggest takeaway. I think being more serious and being more strategic is probably my other biggest takeaway. It's like, I think doing, it's don't, don't make money and then build your community. Don't like get the piece of land and then you didn't need the land. Like you didn't need the money. That's not what people care about. Like what they wanted was to hang out with you. Hmm. And it just doesn't cost anything to hang out with people. It's free. So, and for a lot of things, that's true. Um, I think I think a lot of people put their dreams on hold, especially like really simple dreams like getting married or having kids, which are free. I, I mean, that's kind of controversial stance, but um, I have also put my money where my mouth is here. So I suppose I'm allowed to have the controversial stance. But um, it's not that they're easy. That's not the point. It's that they, they are not costly in these other ways. You don't need to like build up resources and then do them. You can just do them. And that itself is the hard thing that you need to like use resources well in order to do. Um, and similarly with building a community, I think I think maybe my biggest takeaway for all the people who, and I hope like thousands, tens of thousands of people do what we did. I think a lot of people talked about this during the pandemic of wouldn't it be nice if we all were living together. I think a lot of people wanted something more utopian than 
what they could have just done in their free time if they got started. And the utopian thing only happens after like 10 years of hard work. So I would just encourage people to like start gathering people rather than dreaming of getting land or dreaming of building a commune or whatever. Mm. We're interested in this idea of unblocking and uh, that's your pinned tweet right now is about how seniuses are obsessed with unblocking each other. And um, on the one hand, the idea is pretty straightforward, but I'd love to hear more um, like specific examples from your life and um, yeah, kind of how you go about it and any advice you'd offer others about unblocking. Yeah. So what is unblocking first is maybe the thing to talk about. And it's like, it's kind of like what I was talking about before. Like everyone has some path that they're meant to be on and you can tell because you can feel it. And I don't know how to talk about it other than that. I hope I develop better language eventually. Um, and it's scary because there's so many ways to go wrong. And there's so many pits that you can fall into. And so sometimes we shy away from the path that we know we're meant to take. And sometimes we um, will avoid a path because the people around us tell us it's it's not going to work or... And then sometimes we'll we'll delude ourselves into thinking that we're capable of something that we're not capable of, which is definitely never the path. The path is never ever to do something that you're not capable of, um, because you're gonna get really hurt in in <laughs> thinking that you can do that and then failing. Um, so, which itself can be, of course, you have to then integrate that back into your story. Uh, but I, it's not like I recommend going out and failing a bunch. Um, so. I think unblocking is largely about like helping people thread this needle where on the one hand, you are delusionally of the belief that um, whatever you currently think is the best thing to do must inherently be the best thing to do. And you are definitely right about what you need to be doing, even though your ideas are bad. Um, in other words, you aren't, you aren't being critical or strategic about your path. So like that's one failure mode. You could call that like delusional or narcissistic failure mode or something. I don't want to, I don't want to call it narcissistic. You can call it like delusional failure mode. And then on the other hand, like shy failure mode or anxious failure mode, which is like, you're literally shying away from what you know you should be doing because you're afraid that you're not going to be able to succeed at it. And in the middle, I'd say there's something like strategic success mode, which is you take the fact that clearly someone has done this before to mean that you are capable of doing it too, then you apply strategy and iteration and reflection to walking that path over and over and over again. And I think unblocking is just about getting people back onto the path and moving them forward and helping them execute good strategies. So like, there's different steps of the strategic process that people are in. Sometimes they need to reflect because they actually already know what they need to do, but they haven't realized it yet. Um, if, if that's the case to unblock somebody just means to help them reflect on their experiences by like moving them through that emotional processing or whatever, sometimes they need to plan. They just like, don't even have a strategy at all, even though they're, they're brilliant. You know, you can tell they have what it takes and they just like, aren't applying themselves. So then it's like, okay, let's come up with a plan. And then once you come up with a plan, you can kind of see, like, they just start moving. They're like, what? Um, I can tell you a, a story about this. Actually, this is, this is a really easy one. We had somebody at one of our Sunday dinners, maybe Priya told this story too, it's such a classic fractal story, who, uh, who said, you know, I'm a poet, but I don't know what that means at our lightning talks. And we were like, what are you talking? Like, I, <laughs> I know everyone was supportive because we have a generally supportive environment where we don't discourage people. And, um, and so everyone was kind of nodding along, but I think internally thinking like, what are you talking about? Like you're a poet, but you don't know what that means. And then he's like, I've never shared any of my poetry before. So you are the first people that I'm going to share my poetry to. And so we were all like, okay, like we've been here before and this is going to be fun. You get to see somebody's first poetry experience, like, you know, but also a little bit of like, um, you know, it, it's definitely, it's not, there's no expectation that you're going to be blown away because it's their first time. Um, so you just want to be there to be supportive. And then he shares this poem and it's really fucking good. So good. Mm. And people are just like blown away. They're like, whoa, that's crazy. And and then somebody whips out a guitar. Tim Blay actually whips out a guitar. And he's like riffing. And then uh, the guy redid his poem as a rap. 
mm. and people are like cheering and <laughs> screaming and like and it, it's it's crazy so he's like so yeah i i don't know what it means to be a poet but i know that this is meant for me and people are like fuck yeah yeah it's mm. definitely meant for you like you need to be doing this so what did it mean to unblock him in that moment well he didn't need to reflect like he did enough reflection he realized he needs to be a poet he had no plan to be mm. a poet successfully somebody said in the audience have you considered going to central park and writing people poems on a typewriter because mm. he said he's really good at improvisational poetry so um he was like no i haven't thought about that that's an interesting idea and then the conversation just kind of moved on um he kept taking more ideas from people who were talking about social media and you know what, what sort of strategies you could do he came back the next week he's like guys last week i told you that i didn't know what it meant to be a poet somebody suggested i go to central park with a typewriter so i did it and i paid off my rent <laughs> and people are like what he's like not only did i pay off my rent I also paid back a loan that I owed to my ex-girlfriend. Wow. And we were like, what? He's like, I think I can do this full time. Like, I think this is my new job. And we were like, Charlie, that's insane. So um, so then he became a typewriter poet. <laughs> like, now he's a typewriter poet. I mean, that's his career. I guess that's what he does. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't... I guess that's the best example of unblocking in, in one instance. It's like what he needed to hear was you're good and you don't need to practice. You just need to go do a thing that can make you money right now because that's going to be your best data. Um, different people need to hear different things um, at different steps. But unblocking is really just about always meeting somebody where they're at and getting them back onto their path. What have you tended to need personally when you're being, when you are getting help being unblocked? I am... I often unblock myself these days, and the biggest way that I unblock myself is by getting somebody to talk to me and like rubber duck about um, whatever I want to say. Like lately, and it makes sense, I guess, because of my my role as like a founder and as a leader or whatever. Um, that what I say and publish and talk about publicly is like a really important part of what is holding me back. Um, so a lot of times I just need to get it out and have somebody help me write it down. Lately, the thing that's blocking me is like, I should be publishing a mm. lot more. I'm just not publishing enough. And I can tell, and it's kind of eating me up a little bit. And so um, there's a, I mean, it depends. Sometimes you want to, sometimes you want to unlock yourself because you actually think this is like a virtue opportunity or an opportunity to cultivate virtue. But I will often start a club that's like devoted to the thing, which has kind of stricter um, requirements for being part of, or I'll start a class or whatever that that forces me to move through the thing. Otherwise, I'll socially embarrass myself because I mm. really don't like socially embarrassing myself. Um, sometimes I'll do stuff like that, but it helps to have a really wonderful wife. It's like I almost struggle to answer your question because I get unblocked so fast by talking to the people around me. I think the step of the pro I don't tend to have as much of a problem strategizing as I have ar articulating myself or reflecting on my experience and putting it into the right set of words that I think are like capture what I want to say perfectly, if that makes sense. So maybe mm -hmm. that's an answer. If one of your friends asks for help from you unblocking them, how do you tend to approach that? Um, I go on a walk. Mm -hmm. Walking is very good mm. um aristotle's school was called the peripatetic school um the walking school and so basically i just think people get their best ideas out when they're on a walk because they don't feel as nervous and also like sometimes it can be awkward like should we be making eye contact while we talk about your problems but oftentimes people's problems aren't in my eyes people's problems are like somewhere out there or up here or down there or whatever and like the fact that they feel like they need to look me in the eyes means they're like getting things from me that they don't need to talk about. The walking is great because no eye contact, but you're still definitely in a container together and you you're moving and you're getting the, your heart flowing. And I think there's just this energy. Um, but I often take people on walks if I feel like they need help. And uh, then we just talk. And I think 
the main thing is to just ask the hard hitting question. I think there's like an unlearning that needs to happen for a lot of adults where they, you need to stop being polite to your friends. It's just not helping them. Your politeness does no service to them. Um, the reason that we have etiquette and grace and politeness is to preserve people's, it's like you, you're, you want to like have these boundaries that, that you're not crossing with each other. And you also want to extend a certain amount of charity to people that you don't know. Um, but in the case of like somebody coming to you for help, they are actually asking you to connect with them and to enter into their kind of circle, into their boundary. So you, you need to like give up on politeness and instead take on kindness and love as kind of your guiding um, norms. So that means you will probably ask questions that are unusual for your relationship with this person when you're trying to help them. But the sorts of questions that maybe a six-year-old would just ask really naturally. So somebody's like, you know, I just haven't been doing this. And you're just like, well, why? Why, <laughs> why haven't you been doing it? Like, just kind of, you can just be kind of straightforward. Or recently, um, somebody was like, I want to, this is a classic. People will tell you what they want. And one of the classic ones that I'll, I'll go through, there's kind of two examples. First, somebody was telling me what they want. They were like, I want to start a makerspace. And I was like, well, what's stopping you from starting a makerspace? Because I know it's super easy to start a makerspace in like the big scheme of all the things in the laws of physics that people have done. Um, it, it, you know, it takes some time, but if they're really serious about it, it's like, well, what's stopping them? And I could tell they were really serious about it. So I was like, what's stopping you from making a makerspace? And they were like, well, money. And I was like, well, what would you use the money for? Like, what is it about the money? Are you talking about like your salary? And they were like, well, no, it's just like equipment and space. And I need to, I need to rent an office. And I just don't know where that money would come from. And I'm like, well, I have a bunch of friends who have workshops in the city and you could just use their space and run your makerspace out of their workshop while you're getting started. So then you wouldn't need any money and you could use their equipment probably too. You need to build some trusting relationship with them, but that you probably need to do that. And they were like, oh, that's interesting. And I was like, is there anything else stopping you now from that? Or do you just want to talk to this person? And they're like, well, that's interesting. Like, I think I should talk to them. And, you know, 20% chance that the makerspace ends up happening because maybe there's some other block that's stopping them. Maybe the salary part really was important. Or maybe, you know, who knows? But, or maybe that relationship doesn't work. But it turned out, like, their block was just that they thought they needed money when, in fact, they needed space. Mm. Uh, and those things aren't the same thing. And you, can tr you don't need to have money to have space. All you need is, like, a relationship. So a second story that's somewhat similar is, like, I was talking to another friend who, in a different situation, who was kind of, like, confused about career. They wanted career advice. And it's because they were, like, at a job that they felt like they were bored with. Um, many, many such cases in the tech industry. And they just didn't feel like they were being pushed. And they weren't working that hard. And they were like, I'm worried that I'm going to get fired eventually. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but one day. And then I won't have any skills. And my mom says, like, I'm not going to be competitive in the market anymore. It's going to be really bad. And I think this is where, like, the politeness thing comes in. It's like, I think a lot of people would be like, don't worry. Like, I was like, no, your mom's right. Of course your mom's right. Yeah. Mm. Like, that is literally going to happen. Like, you're not working that hard. Be and the point of people paying you six figures is for you to work hard to make the money. And if you're not doing that, then one day some manager is going to roll through or some economic crisis is going to happen or maybe everyone at the company is going to start doing that and the company is going to fail. And then you're going to get fired. You're going to lose your job. And then you're going to feel anxious because you already feel anxious. I can tell in this conversation, um, you're going to feel anxious that you're not good enough. And then you're going to undersell yourself in your next career. I, did, I didn't say all this, but it's like, this is so many, this happens to so many people. And, and it's like, your mom's right. You need a competitive advantage that's going to keep you employed if you want guaranteed employment, because right now you don't have them. And she was like, oh, wow, nobody's ever told me that before. Like, nobody's agreed with my mom before. I'm like, well, like, it, yeah, career, like, career is real and, and people will fire you. And it's just a real part of life. And so we got to talk about it. And the so that's the first thing which is like you you don't always have to be polite but i'm like but look there's a lot of solutions to this like why is it that you aren't having fun you know i know there's probably things you do want to work on what is it that you want to do 
And she was like, oh, well, like, I want to be an influencer. And I was like, I didn't ask you what you want to be or who you want to be. I ask you what you want to do. Because this is something that people mistake. Because if you say, if, if, if somebody asks you, what do you want to do? And then you respond, I want to be an influencer. And you think that that is a valid answer to the question. Then whenever you ask yourself, what do I want to do? You're going to respond, well, I want to be an influencer. And then you're going to think that somehow that's like a thing that you can do. But that's not a valid I can't be an influencer right now. I guess, I mean, I'm on, I'm on a podcast. Maybe I'm doing influencing. But, like, I don't identify as an influencer, and I can't just push a button in my head to identify as an influencer. It's not possible. But there are things I can do. So I asked her, well, like, you know, that's not, that's not what I asked. Um, what do you want to do? And she was like, well, I want to have a house, and I want to have a husband, and I want to have some kids. And I was like, well, I didn't ask you what you want to have. You can't, there's no switch that you can press to have those things. What do you want to do? And then she she talked about this amazing thing that she did where she, she went on some um, backpacking trip and she was interviewing all these people on the road and she recorded these videos. And she's like, I love that. I loved it so much. I want to do it again. And I really want to upload those videos because I, I produced them, but I just haven't been uploading them. I'm like, oh, it sounds like you want to upload the videos that you recorded on your backpacking trip. Like that's a lever that's available mm. to you right now. Like we can mm. do that in the next 10 minutes. It's so easy. Um, and that's a clear way to unblock somebody is to get them from like some sort of TV show drama version of what they want to do, which is very abstract and getting them to the concrete action, which they want to take in their life and just saying like, well, let's just do it right now. You know, tell me, show me the video tomorrow, upload it and then send it to me tomorrow and I'll watch it and I'll tell you what I think about it. And since then, she's been uploading videos consistently, and maybe she's on her way to becoming an influencer. I, but but I mean, that's a hard path. But I was like, just do this for a while, because this is what you want to do, and don't worry too much about your career. Just focus on doing what you want to do. And we'll talk again in a month after you've done it a lot, and I bet you'll have way more information about what you want to do, and I bet you'll feel differently about your career at that point. So, you know, who's to say how that story goes? But that's another kind of classic situation where people people paralyze themselves because they aren't focusing on concrete next actions that they can take. Hmm. You mentioned favor abundance earlier. Can you talk more about that and why that's important and how that shows up in your communities? Yeah. Favor abundance is like, it's like, it just costs me nothing to have these calls with people. I like it. It's fun. Could I charge for it? Definitely. Somehow. I don't know how, but like that's coaching work, right? I'm doing coaching work and people charge for coaching work. And, um, but I do it as a favor. That doesn't mean everyone should do it as a favor. Some people should charge for it and they should do it as coaching work because they want to be coaches. That's what they want to do with their career. But with my career, I want to start software engineering school, for instance. That's what I'm doing right now. And for that reason, I have all this free time that I'm not doing my software engineering school or I'm not doing whatever I want to be paid for. And I can either like think, oh, well, I don't have time for that. My time is too valuable for that. Or I can just do the favor. And what I found in a lot of my seniors research is that the greatest groups just did the favors, hmm. even though it wasn't obvious that it would work out. Um, a classic pattern, which would come up over and over, is that there was a deep passion for teaching the junior members, like mentoring junior members. And this was true at Bell Labs. This was true at Xerox Park, um, and and obviously true in some of the clubs like Homebrew Hacker Club and TMRC in the software industry. Just to mention one particular industry. And so, even though like your graduate researchers aren't as smart as you and they aren't as capable of contributing to the project as you, there was a deep reverence for getting them up to speed and helping unblock them and making sure that their projects are going well and making sure their questions are answered, even if it cost you, the most valuable person in the lab, valuable time on your research. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, I think as you help people more, as you do more favors for people, you realize that actually a huge number of the good things in your life come from like weird downstream effects from favors that you did once upon a time. So you can actually start to integrate that as like selfishly good for you. You know, it's like having good karma is good for me. And so I want good karma because it will lead to good things in my life. Um, so eventually that happens. But in the beginning, I don't even think you need to 
believe that. It's like, I think it's just fun for a lot of these people. I think they're just having fun. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I would, I would wrap, you know, I don't really want to do my work right now. I want to procrastinate on my work right now. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to help people because that's like a way more fun thing for me to do. Tyler Cowen talks about the high return activity of raising people's aspirations. And he is famous for responding to emails for almost anyone who sends him an email, no matter how young they are, no matter how irrelevant they might be to like the things he's interested in. Um, and this is surprisingly true of a lot of people. Surprisingly true of like Michael Jordan, surprisingly true of, you know, many of the greats in many of the different industries is like you just kind of track it and you realize like, wow, these people really loved sharing. They really loved giving favors. So um, I guess it just it just feels obvious that I should spend all my free time doing favors because it's fun. It's what I like doing. And it's like selfishly good for me and good for the people around me and good for the world. Are there situations that make you inclined to say no to a favor if someone asked for one? Totally. Um, if I don't want to do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. I just don't do anything I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> obviously, it's different when it's like a responsibility. I will do my responsibilities even if I don't want to. Um, although I will try to negotiate my way out of them if that is available to me as an action and I want to take that action. Um, but... Yeah, I just I don't do favors that I don't want to do. Otherwise, you'll you'll burn your you'll burn your goodwill with yourself, mm. actually, and that is more valuable than the goodwill that you have with others. How do you balance this desire to do favors where possible with caring for your own enjoyment of doing those favors? Yeah. Um, Luckily, I have always been super good at boundaries. Hmm. So I'm, I don't know, attachment styles are in lately. I'm securely attached, I guess, hmm. or whatever. Um, and I don't know exactly what that means. But like, I figure based on how I go about the world. And it's like, I've just never, I've never been in a situation where I like struggled to say no so badly that it caused me a lot of suffering. Uh, I just tell people no. And so I guess one way is that I got lucky. I had really good parents and they taught me how to say no and they taught me how to say yes. I had two older brothers that bullied me. And mm. so like there's a lot of fighting and growling and getting angry and like wanting to hurt people, wanting mm. to be violent toward other people who are violent toward you. And like I think at some point you learn that this full range of expression is available to you in response to anything somebody does and that it's all okay. None of it is like it all has consequences. Some of those consequences might not be okay, but like, it's all, I could do it if I wanted. So I think the real way to balance it is like, sometimes you have to growl at people a little bit and tell them like, no, and get the fuck out of my face and like, stop talking to me. And I don't ever want to see you again. Like I've never, I've never really gone that far, um, but I would be willing to. There are people there are like ways people could push my buttons that would get me to like go as far as burning bridges. And, uh, and I've definitely burnt bridges before. That's, I mean, that's a whole different part of community organizing, but inevitably you will get people that will take everything you have to give them and never give back and do it intentionally in a way that is like clearly kind of psychopathic um, or whatever, like a, pathologizing is not important it's just like clearly extremely bad toxic behavior that goes on for a long time and yeah sometimes these people will not go away until you are violent toward them not physically because um there's a reason that in our society we aren't physically violent it's just really horrible it causes a lot of catastrophe but at least like a little bit emotionally violent and say like get away from me or i'll hurt you have you noticed any trends in what tends to make a doing a favor fun versus not fun and you say no? Trends. A neediness is like a big, it's like if somebody has some, uh, a lot of times people will tell me, will you do this online? This is the maybe the most common request that I get for everything I do. It's like, will you host this online too? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I just say no politely every time. But um, I, just, I just give a polite no because I'm like, no, I won't. And I don't like it. And then sometimes they'll be like, why, sad face, I 
wish I could do it online. And, you know, I'll just, I'm willing to be polite probably like five times before I'm mean. But it's like, I'll just politely again be like, I just don't have fun doing it. That's a common one. Um, another trend is, is like a similar thing where they'll ask me to like do something that's kind of big. Hmm. It's like, hey, can I like, it's like, can I crash on your couch for a week? It's like, no, no, <laughs> that's like a really long time. And I don't know you. You're a, you're a literal total stranger who has never talked to me before. You're not in my replies. Like, no, you can't crash on my couch for a week. Um, and, that, and again, you could just be polite in most of these cases. But a, a lot of, I think the common refrain is that it's either something I've, I've clearly said I don't want to do before, or it's just, it's clearly a big ask that, you're just like, that would be really hard mm. to do for you. So no, I can't do that. Conversely, On the flip side, like the things that are, yeah, it's like the things that are really easy to say yes to. Like people will ask for my advice. It's like, dude, that's, so, that's the easiest thing of all time. It takes me like 10 seconds to come up with advice. Mm. And then I just have to type it and I type it 120 words per minute. So that's super easy. Um, people ask me to review things they've written. That one's really easy because I just thoughts just appear when i read the text mm. um people will ask if they can come to an event or something and that's like that one's always i don't know that one's always on like the w interesting borderline where i don't recommend you invite yourself to events but also i do recommend you open yourself up to connections with grace so it's like anytime somebody is like gracefully asks me if they can come hang out I love that, and it's really easy to say yes or say no, um, depending on what I need to say based on the event. Uh, and oftentimes I can say yes, because a lot of my events are open to the public. Um, another common one is like people want me to connect them with somebody else. That's super easy to do in a lot of cases. I just do back channel and I just ask. Uh, so I think I think a lot of a lot of times when people are kind of like querying me, I love that. I love when people ask me questions. That's super easy. Um, it's different if they're like compelling me to do something, I guess. Mm. Don't compel people, just query them. <laughs> mm. Looking forwards, can you tell me about your plans for Fractal and Fractal University and this coding bootcamp? Yeah. So the plan is still to build a golden age in New York City. And there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different subtasks that I see as important for me to do that. And and really it's like, what is a golden age? And yeah, whatever. Um, so so defining that concretely is kind of one of the important tasks in itself. But I tend to define things through action rather than defining things through like text or abstraction. And so sometimes people are like, well, what do you mean by, you know, education should be better? And it's like, well, I can't tell you, but I can show you. Uh, I want to start a homeschool. That's one of my big plans for Fractal and Fractal University. And um, I can't tell people exactly what that'll be like because I don't know yet and I can't know yet, but it'll be super Montessori inspired. I was a Montessori principal for a time and that left a big mark on me. And And the reason I did that in the first place is because I was studying it a bunch. So she, as a thinker, left a big mark on, on me. Um, and it'll definitely, it'll be a little bit taking children seriously. Uh, like David Deutsch, it'll be a little bit... Um, It'll be a little bit John Holt, a little bit Seymour Papert, Fred Victor, Alan Kay. It's like all my heroes will kind of blend together a little bit. It'll be a little bit Fractal University. Uh, but but ultimately, it's it's going to be up to the kids, like who who's around. And my daughter will be born in a couple weeks. So um, that's a big plan. There's going to be a lot more kiddos running around pretty soon. Mine will be among the first, but we already have two friends who are giving birth in the same couple weeks as us, so over these next couple weeks, and then we already have a several friends in the neighborhood who have kids, and I think one of the reasons we don't have so many kid events is just because we don't have kids yet. I think now that we do, we'll just be hanging out with those people like way more, and then a lot of events will be targeted that way. Um, and Fractal University, I think we'll start having more classes like that. We did our first babies class last semester, and we'll probably start doing more. Um, the civic stuff will continue to happen. Uh, I think I mentioned this on Twitter somewhere, but it's like, I want to start electing my friends to mm. um, the government. I mean, it's not my, it's not my call, 
it's the people of New York's call. And um, I just want to do the groundwork and, and do some campaigning. It sounds really fun. And I, I think a lot of people who are on the internet are um, ambitious and young and well-read and um, wise. And a lot of those people should be stepping up as leaders for their city. And so we want to start local, start with our, our city government and administrative positions. But I would love to just encourage people to unblock, unblock people who already have a career in politics ahead of them, but who are saying like, that's not for me because I don't know how. Um, I'd love to unblock those people because it's a really complicated process. A lot of people have struggled to break in. Uh, so that's over the next few years. The boot camp, I want to expand a lot. I think the tech scene in New York is like, There's a couple ways I could put this. One is New York's GDP per capita is lower than San Francisco's, despite being a denser city with better transit, with, I think, better infrastructure, better governance. Um, I like New York City more. It has more agglomeration effects. We should have higher GDP per capita. Why does San Francisco have higher GDP per capita? And the answer is the tech companies. And um, that's, not, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. We should emulate San Francisco. Uh, I think... There's something to emulate here where we can inspire a generation of people to build. And it's not about GDP, right? This is just like, there's hard. it's hard to point at the specific thing that I'm pointing to. But it's like literally San Francisco's GDP per capita is two times New York's. Like, what's going on? How do you, how do you explain that? And it gets explained in more human terms that are, you know, some of which you want to emulate and some of which you don't. Some of the ones I do want to emulate are like, San Francisco's people are way more invested in and interested in technology in a beautiful way, I think. When, when I go there and I talk to people, they are so excited about what they can build with their own hands, with their own minds, and in community. They're so excited about building new things that solve problems. They're excited about building machines that can pick apples from apple trees, and they're excited about building drones that can um, check to see if structures are going to crumble and make sure that they don't. And they're excited about building robots that can paint walls and I don't know they're excited about so many weird and interesting things and that culture that beautiful culture of being excited about what people can make which I see as um, something that I had when I was in high school and that I had my whole life as a child dreaming about what we could do if we just took advantage of our um, talents and traded them with each other I want to import that to New York it is already here we have it. A, a lot of parts of Brooklyn have it, especially. But it's not as big as in San Francisco, clearly. And I would love people here to be the cultural leaders of what we can do creatively if we make things together. Um, and I want people to be the cultural leaders of like defining how technology can be used for good and how technology can like make the world more fun or more interesting or more exciting or whatever. Um, Maker spaces, I think, are like a big part of this. And so the boot camp is, is not just a kind of attempt at doing a training, an industrial education and training program, because there's a lot of that. I want people to feel like they can find work that is good, solid, steady pay. And I think people deserve that. And I think we are failing a lot of Americans in giving them an education that provides that for them. Um, people want a lot of different things in life. Not everybody wants intellectual stimulation out of their education. Sometimes people want a career. So there's some sense in which I want to build a career in training school. And then there's another sense in which I want to build a cultural <clears throat> movement that uh, kind of rivals San Francisco's cultural movement and, and moves all the way into high schools and junior high schools and you know, people getting into building robotics, all sorts of cool things. That's in the future. I think we'll start designing kind of more high school programs at some point. Um, so I guess we'll kind of work down from Fractal University down into high school and work from our literal infant child up. Maybe somewhere in the middle, there'll be a full schooling community. Um, and then Fractal, I think we'll just keep growing. So Fractal has expanded kind of into two different neighborhoods. And I think that will keep happening. Um, because again, there's no there's no governance structure. There's no like LLC that is fractal that manages or owns any of this stuff. Just each household decides for itself what it wants to do and who it wants to be. And people 
each household kind of encourages their friends to move in nearby if they want to do that. Um, so fractal one, I guess you'd call it, or fractal in Bushwick has kind of grown to some 50 to 60 people and will keep growing. And now we're kind of in fractal in Fort Greene, which is kind of more of a parenting community, and that's continuing to grow. And we've heard some rumors that people want to start a fractal on the Upper West Side. We've heard some rumors that people want to start a fractal in Park Slope um, and a fractal in Astoria. So maybe we'll have, maybe that will keep happening. Um, the university, I'm excited to teach more practical classes. We have a motorcycle repair class coming up this mm. semester. And uh, I'm really excited about that. That clearly fits into my tech thesis. It's like people should feel empowered to repair the tools and technologies around them rather than feeling like they just have to throw them away. Um, so I'm, I'm personally really excited about continuing to build out this tech education uh, system in, in New York. Uh, but maybe that's, those are the main things that I have on my mind and everything else will just kind of happen as it happens. Hmm. Do you have a sense of how you might grow as a person or how you want to grow or how you'll need to grow in the coming decades? Well, I'll need to grow as a father. Um, I'm excited for that challenge, and I think it will be a challenge, but I also think I'm, well, I'm genetically selected to be a father. Hmm. Every single one of my fathers was a father. And uh, it's the one trait that I share with every one of my ancestors, I guess. So there's... There's a sense in which I know I can do it, and I know I can do it well, um, but it's just going to be really hard, I'm sure, in all the expected ways. I'm really excited to learn how to have fun and to play with my daughter, and I think she'll make me more playful and more energetic, and she'll give me kind of new life as well as uh, as a dad. And in that sense, I think... Well, I guess I guess aside from parenting, I, I think that will extend into how I view the world broadly. But aside from parenting, I will continue to need to grow as a as a leader and employer. Employer is a big one. Um, my suspicion is that this business is just way more grounded than the previous one I started, and already just seems way more likely to succeed. Um, in my previous business, I sold. <laughs> like three units, two mm. units, kind of like two and a half units or something, <laughs> you'd say, of the product. And it's like they were subscription sales, but it's just, and it was like so much work for so few units of sale. Um, and I thought eventually we'd turn the corner and we'd make a bunch more sales, and it just never happened. But in this case, we've already sold 18 units of mm. the product, and each of those units are somebody's full software engineering education and that's over the course of like how many months has it been since we started like two months or something so uh i'm just much more prepared i'm in a much better position to offer this to the world i'm in a much better position to sell it and um the amount of like actually doing it to building it that i'm doing is yeah, that's another interesting one is like building the thing is not the same thing as doing the thing. Uh, and people can mistake that, especially tool builders can mistake that. So there's, it just feels really grounded. So anyway, I expect to need to grow as an employer. I suspect I'll need to hire people and manage a team and continue to grow uh, profit and loss. And like, I'm excited to do all that in a more grounded way because I think a lot of businesses get it wrong in the same way that my roommates got being roommates wrong back in the day when we wouldn't look each other in the eyes and we wouldn't acknowledge each other's presence in the room. There's something where like the common corporate experience in America feels like adversarial and nervous all the time, which is super crazy and unhealthy. And I think it would be cool if I could build an organization that feels collaborative and fun and exciting with like new adventures on the horizon all the time for each team. And I don't think that's easy. I think that's gonna be a challenge that I'm gonna to have to learn how to do and have to experience failure along the way, just like Fractal. Hmm. 
want to pull up a tweet from the archives and ask you about it. Uh, sure. You said, this was from 2022. You said, being on Twitter creates a weird pain for me because it's very obvious that the wise people aren't rich and the rich people aren't wise. And this fucks with me on like every level. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts about that. You may have changed your mind or your experience. Yeah, with that, yeah. But um, no, no, no. I, I like that tweet. Mm -hmm. It's angsty. So that tweet, can you tell me what year that tweet's from? Uh, it's from July of 2022. July of 2022. Yeah. So um, a very angsty tweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was experiencing a lot of angst then in general. So there's there's some part that I should just acknowledge is like, this is a little bit of a retort to a culture that I felt like didn't reward. Uh, I think crypto probably, exper like I experienced a lot of this feeling because of that crypto boom that happened and the bust. And then there was this big tech boom and bust. We were still in the middle of the tech boom actually, where like the zero interest rate tech hiring process was kind of crazy and people were raising on insane valuations and um, and all that stuff happens on Twitter. So at the same time that all of the like best thinking in the world happens on Twitter, I, don't, I mean like, and other places on the internet, but um, it felt like I was in this place on the internet where at the same time I could see people like fast and bolt. I wouldn't be surprised if that was a direct response to bolt a tweet by Ryan Breslow or whatever his name, I think Ryan Breslow. And uh, the, the context there is like somebody named Ryan Breslow kind of defrauded a bunch of investors by raising hundreds of millions of dollars on a billion dollar valuation, starting a company that purported to sell checkout, it's hmm. like a one click checkout solution. And I'm not trying to get into the whole tech drama. That's not really important. All this was on Twitter and it was like big and this guy was famous and he had hundreds of thousands of followers and he had so much money and he was like, it was crazy. And there was in many such cases and they're all right there. And I'd read their threads where I'm kind of like, this is so clearly like inch deep. It's just shallow. And then I would be next to one of my friends who's starving or like Visa tweeting, retweeting one of his tweets from 2020 where he's basically just a starving artist, like on the same platform, shouting into the void to an audience that is hardly paying attention, but is slowly growing. And nobody, and, and these people are seeing each other's tweets. They're in the same room, mm -hmm. basically. So there's just a funny, I don't know, that it's really bizarre and cool that we live in such a liberal society and such a, I guess, crazy, beautiful, chaotic society that you have these starving artists who are on the verge of what I think will become massive sociocultural breakthroughs for potentially an entire generation. And these people are next to people that are going to become fraudsters. And one of them is rolling in hundreds of millions of dollars and one of them is starving. Not starving, but like, you know... Um, struggling to make ends meet, for instance. And uh, and like you're here, observe, you know, as the observer, you're kind of like, okay, which one do I bet on? Like who mm. is going to be the one that's going to, that I should hitch my cart to or that I should support or I should be fr become friends with? And uh, it fucks with me on every level, I guess, is just some, some expression of how much that feeling of having to issue judgment can make you... I don't know, kind of, kind of go crazy a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing uh, something that I care a lot about. So I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it and I could hear about how you see it. Um, yeah, well, I'm actually curious to mm -hmm. hear what your thoughts are on that a little bit. Well, um, you know, this was a big part of my monastic training was building i'd say like right relationship with power where yeah um we would talk about these different attributes wisdom love and power and i have this article i wrote trustworthy leaders that was um that i wrote while i was at the monastery and it's like very much in that frame but um basic ideas that 
like you could i mean lots of different people frame how to put it i yeah i don't i guess what i'm why i'm sort of hesitating is i don't necessarily completely buy into this frame now i put it pretty strongly at the time like but you know at the time a lot of people and still to some extent sort of um see the world in terms of these like vast problems that we're facing and so there was well, this one way of describing this problem which is that um the people who have power don't have wisdom and love and the people who have wisdom right. and love don't have power and then how that practically worked out for me even if i my own frame has sort of updated to some extent is just being okay with power and like uh acknowledging the power that i already have being comfortable talking about power and then also being comfortable seeking power and building power because i know myself and the yeah like to the extent that i have wisdom or love i know my heart is in the right place and that i mean well and want to help people and i'm not you know doing this i'm not seeking power for its own sake and so i want to help people and uh that sort of thing so um do you think yeah um yeah i agree with you a lot like and I agreed with that frame a lot. And there, there's a sense in which my frame has shifted too, where I'm kind of like, oh, actually there's like something where I was missing some third thing where a lot of people are just like distracted or something. Maybe that's mm. that's one interesting way of describing it where it's like, it's not actually that there's kind of these two camps where power needs to be redistributed. It's like, there's just so many people that are not paying attention at all. Mm. And if you help those people come into their own power, they they would, at the time of exercising their power, start to develop wisdom through experience, I guess. Mm. And I do think, yeah, I also think there's like unique wisdoms that you can only get through being powerful. And so it's it's just really easy to throw stones and all those things. But But I guess I do often think about like what the what people are getting wrong or what people are missing about power such that so many people have to go through this private revelation like uh my friends and i have this joke now that i really didn't come to until this year mm. and and i still feel nervous saying like on a podcast for instance but it's like it is a it is wrong sometimes we'll even be like it's a sin mm. to be poor by choice mm. and do i fully believe that in my heart of hearts it's like no you can make it you can make an argument um definitely to convince me otherwise but like all things equal it's it's a sin to be poor by choice mm. and why you know what was i missing before where i didn't believe that and why do i believe it now it's like there's i basically think there is a way in i still don't even know what what's going on because i i, I know i must have done have done it but i don't know how to describe it but it's like people people will count themselves out of games that they think are played by losers, mm. even when the game itself is super valuable. Tech is a good example. And it's one of the reasons I want to change the tech culture in New York. There's a real sense in which in this city, people think tech is a game for losers and greedy people and tech bros. Mm. And it's like, there's a real, real sense in which the culture believes that tech is a force for evil, that takes tech makes our lives worse, that tech extracts our data and like makes us hate each other and drives political violence and Facebook is destroying the world. And um, to the extent that it is true that many of the powerful actors in the tech industry are using their power unwisely and this causes pain and suffering, it is not true. Like, to the extent that that is true, uh, or even though that's true, I guess, is what I mean to say, even though that's true, there's a sense in which people place the blame on like some associative property. Like they place the blame on the building technology. But then if you, if you were to see a six-year-old child put together a train set, you would never say that they are participating in greed and evil the way that you would say that like a tech bro is when they join a Jane Street or something. Hmm. And in that, and to the extent that we do that and associate those two things, we do like huge wrong, like we're being super unwise and causing hmm. a lot of suffering. And I think there's a similar thing where people are associating wealth with um, like lack of wisdom in a way that is just gonna cause like a bunch of people to be poor. <laughs> 
which is obviously really bad. Like poverty sucks. Hmm. Um, but I don't know if I don't know if that's a similar line of thinking to what you came across or or where you ended up diverging. Hmm. Well, I think the main divergence that I end up having, I think the the spirit of the thing still feels very true. I I mostly just haven't found it helpful or enlivening or energizing or even strictly speaking accurate to see the world in terms of oh there are these huge vast global problems anymore like um, right from a separate well one like subjectively phenomenologically i just find steering by fun like much more energizing and like yeah steering by oh there's a huge problem is like sort of short-term motivating but like burn is like can burn you out and um on a bigger perspective like Mm. one of my heroes is Peace Pilgrim and she talks about how problems come to us to help us to grow spiritually and she says that that's true on a collective scale as well and I think that's a much more empowering view for me if I do acknowledge that there are problems like I don't know I'm concerned about like the environment for example still but yeah I feel um like oh this is an opportunity for us to grow collectively rather than like this intrinsically bad thing that we're bad and the problem is bad and oh no or something right. like that right yeah mm -hmm. well, yeah we've been... we've been calling this fractalism in our heads <laughs> a little bit which is like well and one of the reasons we call it fractal is this idea that like dig where you stand was a big principle of Priya and I when we were starting the project, which mm. is like, you can only solve the problems that are in the reach of your tool kit. Um, you can only solve the problems in arm's reach. Eventually, if you build like a lot of problem solving capacity, the problems will actually come to you. Mm -hmm. It will feel as if the world reshapes itself so that you all these bigger problems are within arm's reach. And if you try to overextend your reach, and you don't dig where you stand, it can feel, yeah, extremely demoralizing. Hmm. Well, you have very kindly humored many of my questions, uh, or I should say you have honored my curiosity. I don't like humor because it's sort of pejorative to my curiosity, but uh, in any case, thanks for answering all my questions. I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to talk about or share more about. Well, I have I have curiosities that are interesting to talk about, but it's like I have a rare opportunity. So mm. allow me if, a moment of silence to of course. pick the direct line that I want. Okay, I want to talk I want to talk more about teapot. Mm. Um, it, it basically didn't come up at all in the podcast, except through some background information. And the name is not particularly important. Um, but mainly, I want to talk about Twitter. And, and there's something like, I want to know... I want to know more about the network dynamics that brought us here. Uh because I think maybe to a lot of people, those will be foreign. Hmm. And and even to me, they're foreign. Like, I still don't understand. Um, I know that once you visited the rabbit hole, which was our house in San Francisco, mm -hmm. to visit Eric Lee. Um, I actually and... remember visiting Priya. I don't... Oh, you're visiting Priya. Yeah. Eric, yeah. And then maybe once one other time you met Priya at a conference or something. But in hmm. reality, we know each other through through Twitter mostly. Mm -hmm. How did you come to find this Twitter network? Like, what's your story there? And mm. yeah, I'm, I'm interested in where we met in the middle. I see. Hmm. Um, well, uh, I've been using Twitter since like 2007 or something, I think. And, wow. uh, you know, I think statistically it was something like 100 tweets a year for many years or something. It wasn't like I was using it extensively, but um, I think I started using it more and more as the years went on. And then, um, yeah, I took building a second brain in 2017 and started using it quite Ooh. a bit more. 
and then uh, wait, tell me more about that. What what did Tiago Forte teach you? What did you learn in building a second brain? It's funny. I was just writing about this yesterday, actually, because I'm writing a book about curiosity, which is one of the three parts of my life's work. This, I mean, this this podcast is sort of one of the more public facing parts of my curiosity work. But um, I was just writing about that for the book yesterday. Um, that's uh, wow. Uh, this is going way back. Um, I mean, I I had read David Allen's GTD book when I was like 13, maybe, and right. used it for so many years and like read Life Hacker religiously as a teenager and stuff and 43 folders and all that stuff. And um, I think kind of implicitly had that way of approaching my life built in from that. But Tiago's stuff gave me just like a lot of practical tools for how to organize my notes. And then also, I think, yeah, I was writing about this yesterday, just sort of like raise my ambitions as well of like, oh, this is what you could do with, like, not only are these practical tools for storing your notes, you know, half of which I don't even use anymore necessarily, but there's just a lot more you could be doing with what you are storing. And and I kind of had that sense before, but he really showed a practical way to make use of that. And I ended up working with him for a bit and that was really cool. And um yeah, but coming back to this Twitter stuff, I, I think that had me posting on Twitter more. And um, that was a year because I, I trained at the monastery for like two years and I left for a year and then went back for another three years. And then I went back to help start um, a branch in California. And that's that's when I met Priya. And you know, I was just on Twitter a bunch. And in some ways, I think like meditation training and spiritual practice was really, really important to me. And I cared a lot about that. And also... I felt sometimes in retrospect, like an odd duck at the monastery where um, like meditation training and Buddhism and spiritual practice weren't the only things I cared about. And um, that's that's sort of a simplistic characterization of it. But I, I always felt like an odd duck in any case. And uh, Twitter was where I really felt like I could find my people and people who are interested in other things that I was interested in, even if they had nothing to do with that. And um, yeah, I think I'm, that's when I it sort of took off from there. So I think you and I, I mean, you and I have just sort of always been in the same neighborhood. And I mean, I've known about you since I was uh, first, you know, saw Priya. And uh, and then I've, I've been very curious about Fractal from afar. I have this tweet about that I've referenced to you, I think before about the Hegelian synthesis of individualism and collectivism. And in some ways, like for me, monastic training was like you could characterize it as like individualism deprogramming boot camp, where it was like, hey, individualism isn't really working for us. And, you know, like that you were saying about roommates, and I see so many symptoms of that. And it was kind of, I mean, monasteries are intrinsically collectivist institutions from collectivist cultures. And I saw like a whole different way of living. And that was really good for me in my 20s. And then in some ways kind of stopped being good for me. And I needed to almost swing back towards individualism. And so that's where that phrase comes from for me of like, hey, I think there are things that are really good and really not working about each of those strategies. And to me, seeing what you are doing with Fractal feels like um, a, a nice um, balance of the things that are working in each. And uh, that's made me curious about the project for a while. And I think I have this thing called the quest map that's for my empowerment work. and it's about like help to how to that Tyler Cohen's thing about like raising people's ambitions and how to implement that practically. And so the quest map is like a view on how we do that in the empowerment work that I do with uh, Mary and some others. And um, from that perspective of the quest map, Fractal, both the co-living and Fractal University and this boot camp that you're starting, those are all like level four projects and um, where someone there's like a crew of people who are working on something together and they have like a vector in Visa's term of like, this is where we're going. This is what we're trying to do. And it's not just a one-off project of like, you know, Hey, let's run this one event or something like that. There's a recurring base of intention. And so from that perspective, like you all are, feel like my peers to what I'm trying to do. And so I've just been like, Oh, there are people in my scene in my community who are, have their own level four ambitions. And uh, it's been, really good to like keep an eye on what you all are doing um how should fractal and service guild be collaborating mm, that's a great question <laughs> uh 
Um, well, just tonight is the archipelago kickoff. So there's like four of us that apply and uh, cool. I think one of us is sick, but it has one our, crew as one crew. Yep. Let's um, go. It's like a subset of the guild, but um, yeah, so that's already a way that things are happening. And I've been also taking David Schimmel's EDM course, which has been great, as you know. And um, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, your music's awesome. Hey, thanks, that's man. Been really cool to watch. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was really excited about you taking the class because I could tell you had a lot of motivation to take it. I'm really sad that I had to drop it because mm. we started this boot camp. But um, I was having so much fun. It's crazy how fun it is to like, while you're doing it, I think there's a little bit of suffering where I'm like, I'm just like a button pusher, like beep mm -hmm. boop. All I do is push buttons all day. Like, I don't know how to do art. And then when it's done, I'm like, I'm a genius. Mm. The coolest thing I've ever done. It's great. I think there's a huge, there's a bit of a learning curve to like get up to being able to make stuff. But uh, once you can have the basics down, it's like there's so much possibility. So I've been really enjoying that. Um, yeah, just to come back to this question, though, of yeah. how we can help each other, I think I got obsessed with strategy for a while, like military strategy and business strategy. And one of the things I really learned was that like mutual situational awareness is the best thing between like allies. And so yeah. just like being apprised of what each other are up to is. That's smart. Yeah, we should just do a do a mutual situational awareness meeting. That's right. A brief, a memo. <laughs> I love it. I love a it. A debrief. Um, yes. Well, that's that you just updated my mental models. That's great. Mutual situational awareness. Brilliant. Mm. Oh, I got to got more where those came from. That. So. It specifically creates the conditions for good consequences with allies. So right, yes, where um, you don't need to have like a plan of like, oh, this is specifically what we need to do to help each other, but just being yeah. aware in the same way that you are with your friends, but kind of on the higher scale of like organizations or groups or something like that. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and you can, yeah, you can engineer the conditions for mutual situational awareness, and that's, that's right. what's really powerful about it. Um. What, yeah, do you, do you have any other bangers like that? Can I just be... <laughs> <laughs> that was a good feeling. Uh, well, I've been putting out the banger it? since 2007, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything yeah. else in the military strategy? I've done no oh. in the military stuff at all, except the Apollo mission, which is like not even really military. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got this post strategy 101 that's kind of like uh, I dial, I tried to summarize everything that I learned about it into like the most practical stuff that's like really yeah i mean frankly it well so in my world view like time is weird and uh time is like non-linear and that may or may not be true but that's how it seems to me and um right it was really weird being this like sort of monk type person getting obsessed with military strategy and i didn't even know why at the time but i couldn't be doing building like the service guild without that like it's just all of those ideas that are in that post are baked in so um, my sense is a lot of them would be sort of implicitly familiar to you all since you already have gotten to the point that you've gotten to. But yeah, there might be something in there that's useful for you. Yeah, well, I'm implicitly aware of mutual situational awareness. I do it all the time. It's just mm -hmm. like the name matters because I'm often giving advice to people on how to do fractal. Mm -hmm. And like, I, like I was mentioning, you kind of said, like, what is fractal secret or something, something earlier? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. I've never tried to put it into words. Mm -hmm. You say that it's like, oh yeah, our secret is mutual situational awareness. Like we are way, we are super densely packed, and there's a lot of communication, and people all have a lot of good relationships. So everyone knows what's going on with everyone else, and they all want to help. Mm. And and like I couldn't, I couldn't possibly predict all of the good things that come out of every week here because there's nobody in charge of it. It's just emergency. It's just yeah. yeah, it's just everybody trying to do things, but. Trying to do things is not good enough if you don't have awareness of mm. how to help. It's yeah, it's super interesting. Um, I would also, oh man, the building a second brain influences. The Gallen, David Allen getting things done is interesting. I uh, I was a big Cal Newport deep work. Mm, person, okay, so I was never into getting things done myself. I was mm. like second order into getting things done through Cal Newport, mm. um, which I've since I moved on from. Obviously, in a lot of ways my productivity system is very different have you read productivity for special snowflakes oh i would have read that a long time ago but 
uh I think is that, Forte that's, essay. yeah no i definitely read that that's i think that's where you start talking about mood-based productivity too yeah so, mood-based productivity yes. exactly where yeah. man that's it's mission huge. critical yeah totally unlocked a bunch of productivity for me where i'm just like oh i can just do what is interesting based on my mood and then i'll make more progress amazing definitely definitely that's 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 the fuel of the service guild right there so yeah, yeah. what do you think is the like we're in the same neighborhood like you said hmm. um what are the taboos in our neighborhood hmm. in your view if there are any or like what are the blind spots is maybe something i'm i'm more on twitter in. yeah hmm. let's see and i don't necessarily mean to be critical of the it's like there are lots of junior members. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure the junior members have lots of blind spots, but I'm curious what the blind spot of the entire culture is hmm. in your view. Well, it's hard to see blind spots. So I'm sure that the ones that you're asking about are very much my own. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I think there's a, there's a community norm. I, I would describe it as there's a community norm of like avoiding object level contention, especially on the timeline. And for me personally, this might just me projecting my personal view, but like if I don't even tend to like to discuss things on the time, like I'd, I'd much rather like talk to you for two hours and like have an in-depth verbal conversation where I could look at you. And like, if you're having a conversation with someone on a Zoom call or in person, you kind of can't forget that they're a person who has their own life and their own feelings and their own goals and all that. And whereas if it's on the timeline and it's just text, like it can be less, um, I don't know, I, I'm somewhat conflict avoidant, but I'd rather have like conflicting discussions verbally synchronously ideally in person if possible but certainly over zoom and so i think there's a shared norm that's part of what makes it so sustainable to have community online of like let's not talk about object level stuff or like let's not get too specific about like politics or you know i don't know and granted there are many exceptions to this but i think being careful about such topics is part of what makes it somewhat resilient of like just right. kind of knowing the limitations of the medium so that's what right. comes up for the blind spots for me yeah like it makes that's it harder to discuss certain things or or like really have meaningful conflict like i don't know i don't think people are really good at doing conflict on the timeline in general yeah um in general why aren't there more why aren't there more stage four is stage four the highest stage stage five stage six well, so the stage, the, the the end of the map would be what you call a golden age or we call a heavenly realm. Um, yeah. So, um, it's, and I think of that as sort of like iterative or um, it's like, oh, you don't necessarily yeah. like finally reach it at this one discrete moment at time or something. But um, regardless of whether they're higher stages, though, why aren't there more stage four projects? There, there are people who are capable of leading them. Well, so... When I'm some of this is I'm trying to reverse engineer my own like how I got to stage four, level four and like make those skills legible to people. But I mean, level three is do a collaboration with one other person or or more, but like one one off collaboration. And I think basically people aren't that good at collaboration and yeah. um, people make pitches to each other that I think are like pretty bad. Um, oh, so true. <laughs> so That's really good. I've done a ton of iterations of collaborating with people. Like it depends yeah. how you count, but something like like 30, 40, 50, 60, like meaningful collaborations with people. And that kind of separates the wheats from the chaff of like, this isn't gonna work. This pitch is like not gonna be persuasive to someone if I'm just like and and importantly, having resonance with someone is not sufficient to have a good collaboration with them. You need to have more than it's like necessary, but not sufficient. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, I yeah. also think one other thing is this I'd like say, project would you call this project management failure? Or do you think also a theory of mind failure it? of like yeah. not understanding other people and that they're different than you. And like, especially you have to frame a collaboration in terms of making it win win. And so you have to understand yeah. what would make this a win for someone else as well. Yeah. Um, I think also, at least for me, a problem that I'm experiencing is that I don't I mean, I'm really curious about how this plot line will turn out, but I don't want to create a for-profit company and I don't want to create a not-profit company, not-for-profit company. Those uh, organization, like those things don't quite feel like the native to the organization that I want to create for various reasons I could get into, but um, yeah. I, know I don't thing. know. 
So yeah, we we still haven't incorporated Fractal or Fractal University, for instance. Right. And it just didn't it didn't feel right to incorporate it, and that's weird, mm -hmm. um, in some ways. And then it wasn't until Fractal Bootcamp came along that I was that like, oh, I have I that. have a for profit offering to the yes. world, like obviously for profit offering because it's about money. Yes. What I am promising you is that I will get you a six figure job, basically, and like I will charge for that some percentage of the value I create that is directly economic because it's an economic operation. So, but there's, but so much of what I'm interested in just isn't operating on that. You could almost say like there's many different realms or whatever. And like there's the, the physical matter moving and there's emotional moving and spiritual moving. And then there's economic or financial movement. So many of my projects are just not at all interested in like moving finances around or moving mm -hmm. economics around. They're so, they're way more interested in moving relationships or something i was like what am I, i'm gonna move your relationship from like point a which is a four out of ten to point b which is eight out of ten and then i'm gonna be like yeah for like a 2x improvement in your relationship quality that costs two thousand dollars it just doesn't make how do i develop a isomorphism between mm. between like helping somebody with their relationships and charging money it's just so weird mm-hmm it feels like in exchange they should like help me with my relationships. It just it's like a more natural uh, trade. Hmm. So I get what you mean. Do you know? I don't know. Like, what are your what are your preliminary thoughts on how you might solve the conflict? Or is there is there a problem that's being presented that needs to be solved? Um, I think it is. It's not an urgent problem, but it is an important problem. I would say, and it's one yeah. that I suspect I'll have to solve in the next month, sorry, couple of years. Uh, yeah, and that's, I've been talking to a few like mentors and advisors about it. And it's like basically one, one of the things my teacher would say is like, don't rush, don't hesitate. So that's yep. that's how I want to approach it. It's like, there's reason to not hesitate and there's also good reason not to rush. So yep. yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It does feel like uh, similarly, there might be some, like one interesting one that I think is like, quasi economic that I'm not unhappy with providing salaries is vibe camp. That's a fun mm. one that's in our scene. Also, yes. would you say stage stage four? Clearly definitely continuously working on it. Yep. And and so it's like, oh, not all stage four projects need to be that are creating conditions of well being need to be non economic. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm very happy to pay money to go to Vibe Camp. Definitely. I'm very happy to like pay these people a salary for organizing it every year. And I, there's something interesting about like, well why? what's different about vibe camp compared to like fractal where i'm not happy accepting money for fractal and i feel like people wouldn't really be that happy paying um there's something where like fractal is supposed to be home and vibe camp is not hmm. and that's kind of interesting but there's also something where like vibe camp is a vacation or something hmm. like vaca like the, i don't know if that's the right word but it's like vibe camp is a event and um and i already have to pay for plane tickets and i already would have to pay for room and board so i'm kind of just like paying also for the organizers but it took a it took two years for us to figure out something that i was willing to accept money for hmm. for fractal wow yeah but they, don't rush don't hesitate it's like as soon as i found it i didn't hesitate at all but also like two years and i couldn't figure it out hmm. Hmm. anyway it seems like uh we're we're about at the about end time, Anything, yes. any last thought just that I'm grateful you uh, joined me. It's been really lovely to learn more about you and also to compare notes about these things. So really appreciate your time, friend. Likewise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was great to be on and I look forward to chatting with you soon and listening mm -hmm. to more of your EDM music. <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs>